here, where we are today, uh, they were getting ready for, to host the World's Fair. Uh, they had just about finished building the Space Needle. Uh, the monorail was starting to run, test runs down the track. And one local third grade school teacher decided to hold a contest for her students. And she, what, what she did, what her, the assignment she gave them was to predict what life would be like 50 years in the future, in the far off year of 2012. Now one little boy said he thought by then we would all have flying cars. Another boy said, he, no, we'd have personal rocket ships. That's what we'd have in the year 2012. And one crazy girl in the class, and they probably laughed at her for this, she said that in the year 2012, we would all have telephones in our pocket. <laughs> Why do some predictions come true and others seem as far-fetched today as they did 50 years ago? Take artificial intelligence, for example. This slide is of the predictions of when we will get computers that are as smart as people. And these are the predictions shown over time from the beginning of computer science to today. And what's interesting is if you average the predictions over time, the average comes out about 50 years, 50 years ago, and it's about 50 years away today. So again, we're not very good at predicting things. And yet, that's really the, um, the main task that faces all entrepreneurs. You know, in, in some sense, predicting the future is easy. It's predicting when it's going to happen that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I want to back up and tell you a, a little about me. Um, that's me as a kid. I grew up in the Seattle area. I grew up in Bellevue, actually. Um, what was that? Not the one on the left. The one on the left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in eastern Washington there, and I'm, I'm, that's a horny toad that I found. I, yeah, we don't have those on this side of the, of the mountains. But, um, you know, when I was a kid, I had a great childhood. I look back on it fondly. But, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, life was dull. <laughs> I mean, you know, there were no computers, no video games. Um, and, and not only was it, was it boring, in a way, I, I'm not sure kids today can remember, but it's also, we were very isolated back then. Um, you know, if you think about how you feel when your uh, cell phone battery runs out, uh, when the internet is down, um, it was like that for decades. <laughs> Fortunately, by the time I got to high school, the first personal computers came out, uh, Apple IIs, Atari 800. Uh, my dad got me an Atari 800, and I just fell in love with this machine and learned to program it, first in basic, then in assembly language. But what to, what to write? Um, you know, the first arcade machines were starting to show up uh, in the local pizza place in 7-Eleven, and so I started copying games that I'd see in the arcades. Um, and, and uh, somebody saw a game that I made, which was a Frogger clone, uh, and a little California company approached me, and they wanted to publish it. And that was how I got in the game business when I was a high school kid uh, in 1982. And uh, so I made games for this company uh, through the end of high school and going into college until uh, the game industry melted down in 1984. This company went away along with uh, many, many other companies. But by then I was in college getting my computer science degree. Um, and uh, one summer I, I got a job working at a local company uh, called Microsoft. Um, they were known for making basic and uh, not too much else. But I got put on a little team to make uh, a spreadsheet called Excel and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I worked on Excel for five years and I worked on Word for another five years. And um, by then I was running a big team at the company and they said, the next thing, Ed, is for you to go and run a business. And we think you should go uh, move to California and run the PowerPoint business. And uh, I said, well, you know, there's really only two things I like to do. I like programming and I like video games, <laughs> you know. So it, it, I knew that running a business meant having to give up programming. Um, 
So what if I go and run a, ga a game business for the company? And it turns out the games group at Microsoft was not, not very big. Were you there back then? You, you were, yeah. right? You were part of the arena team, right? Yeah, I was number 23 or 24. Right. So there were about 50 or 60 people um, full time, and then we had more contractors. Um, Anyway, uh, they told me I was committing career suicide. Uh, multiple vice presidents called me in to yell at me. And they said, I would, why would you leave office one of the most important parts of the company to go work on something nobody cares about? That was my favorite quote. Um, but I, I, I you know, ignored them, put my foot down, said, no, this is what I really want to do, and, uh, and joined the group. And fortunately, they had um, several interesting projects underway and this was one of them the next year we brought out a game called Age of Empires and uh, between Age of Empires and Flight Simulator uh, we actually had a fair amount of money coming into the group and we used that money to reinvest and grow and grow the, the games group and this idea that we were doing something that nobody cares about was actually a really good thing at a company like Microsoft because nobody was messing with this as long as we were making money we were John and I and others we were off spending it pretty much as fast as we were making it uh, you know to work running around working with uh, all the all the people whose games I loved uh, as a kid growing up you know so we did a deal with Chris Roberts which maybe wasn't our best deal we we uh, we acquired FASA and the MechWarrior franchise and many many other things anyway um, so we had fun growing that group grew it up three four or five hundred people and then uh, one day these crazy guys came into my office and they had this idea for to, that we could take DirectX and, and put it in a box and, and, you know, it was like this DirectX box and that was, you know, how the start of the Xbox and um, so then things really got crazy. Then we had, then we could spend money and not have to make money and, <laughs> and so then we could really do anything we wanted. So we went, we bought a, bunch, a company called Bungie, which I was a big fan of, and a bunch of other companies, and, and made a bunch of games, and, uh, and had a really good time. I launched the Xbox. And, um, anyway, by 2004, I was turning 40, and uh, I was having kids, and uh, I was ready to retire from Microsoft. We'll just leave it at that, unless there's more questions later. Um, so anyway, uh, I left the company uh, and wasn't really sure what I was going to do. Um, but soon after I left, I got approached by a couple different groups of people who, who had worked for me. Um, actually, after I left, they canceled some projects. And so the first group, uh, I teamed up with the first group, and we started a company called Fire Ant. And we, um, they were an MMO company, or an MMO group. And we ended up selling them to Sony uh, Online. And they worked for a long time on a title called The Agency, which some of you may have heard of. It never saw the light of day, but it was basically a James Bond MMO. Um, and the, the second group I teamed up with were, was a group of people uh, who had done the Crimson Skies series for me. And um, I'll talk more about them later. It's a group called Airtight Games. Uh, but I was also approached to join the boards of some companies. And uh, I hadn't done that before, but I thought, yeah, that sounds like fun. And I, um, I'll talk about some of the board work that I, that I do. Um, and I, I was also approached by people to be a, an advisor to various things. So <laughs> this basically shows what I do today. Um, and I, it's kind of complicated to explain what I do. Um, so I, I thought probably the easiest way to explain it would be through a set of Victorian postcards. <laughs> <laughs> so these are cards that were made uh, about 1900. They, were, uh, they came out in uh, boxes of candy. Uh, cigarette packs, and what was really fun about them is a couple things. One, um, in the Victorian era, they were um, they were really optimistic about the future. You know, technology was just starting to change the world, and so they were making a lot of predictions about what the world would be like. And these are all actually predictions about what the world will be like a hundred years in the future. I mean, imagine now trying to guess what things will be like a hundred years from now. But the Victorians. They did, on this long series of cards, predict what, what it will be like in the year 2000, or some of them even what it will be like in the year 2012. So that's why I like them. And, and that's actually what the majority of the rest of this talk is going to be about. So we'll start with one like this. This was made in Germany. In, and uh, they thought that in the year 2000, we would have moving sidewalks in our cities. And that would be a great way to get around. Um, one thing to notice is the fashion never changed. It's always Victorian fashion in all these. Um, 
And you know, this is a pretty good prediction. Uh, I mean, we do have moving sidewalks. We don't tend to have them downtown, but we have them in the airports and, and other important places. Um, the only problem with this prediction is the moving sidewalk was actually invented and patented in the 1880s. And it was shown at the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. <laughs> There's another shot of it in the, at the World's Fair in Paris. So this is one really easy way to predict the future, is you, you just predict something that's already been invented. <laughs> but, but these cards, the, um, probably one, the most frequent thing that you find on these cards are airplanes. And you know, the airplane was you know, just right at being invented at that time, and so it was really on the minds of the artists and inventors who, who created these cards. And so there's a lot of speculation about what, how we would use airplanes in the future, maybe in the year 2000. So the idea that you know, we'd have these little flying taxis and you'd wave them down and they'd come and get you, uh, here's another example of that. Um, uh, maybe, you know, when you're married, you'd, get, you'd fly off like this. You'd have, you know, replace the tail with a cast iron stove. <laughs> and then you could bring your chef along. You know, that's nice. <laughs> maybe we'd have, um, you know, kind of hovering vehicles. I'm not sure how they imagined these worked, but, you know, it's, um, they, you, you could hover around. Uh, you know, airplanes could be useful for things. You could uh, use them to deliver the mail. Uh, chimney sweeps could use them to get up to the top of our roofs to <laughs> clean, the, clean the chimneys. So that wouldn't be the first thing that would come to my mind for how to use it, but uh, apparently that was a big problem back then. And, um, and birds, this is a really common one too. You know, airplanes would be a great way to catch birds. <laughs> Yeah, so you got, you know, this is another one, a little guy out catching birds for the airplanes. Isn't that crazy that you'd make like a little airplane to fly with birds? I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> but speaking of airplanes, you see the segue here? Uh, um, the Crimson Skies team, when they, they left Microsoft, they were really all about airplanes. And so that's where the air comes in airtight. And we weren't sure what we were going to make back then. Um, but at the same time, um, I was also approached to join, uh, the first board that I joined was a group called AGEA. And AGEA, like, like anyone who's trying to do something that hasn't been done before, they're trying to predict what is going to be next. And their line of thinking was, well, 3D graphics had been really important to games, and everybody now has a 3D graphics card in their gaming machine. What's the next big thing that's really important in games? What about physics? You know, people like Valve were talking about it with Half-Life. And, and so let's make a physics accelerator, like a graphics accelerator card, and we'll put it into machines. And they actually made these cards, and they did accelerate graphics. Um, so I kind of took the, put these two things together, uh, which is kind of what I do these days, and said, um, well, I know these developers who can develop some demos for you of this physics, right? They're this company called Airtight. So, um, so we put together a little demo of what physics might be like with this physics acceleration card. And of course, it has airplanes, because we also wanted to use this for our next game. So guys at Airtight had a lot of fun putting that together. Uh, alas, even today we do not have hardware physics accelerators in our machines. Um, but uh, we sold uh, Agia to NVIDIA. And uh, the guys are still working at NVIDIA today. So maybe we'll see that in a future NVIDIA graphics card. But also out of that came the physics, uh, physics module, software physics, which is used by a lot of games today. 
Meanwhile, Airtight went on to do a couple things. Airtight made this game, Dark Void, which ironically doesn't have many airplanes in it, but um, you do have a jet pack and you can fly. Um, and then Kim Swift joined and we did a game called Quantum Conundrum. And just this week, uh, we announced the new game that we've been working on for four years with Square Japan, a game called Murdered Soul Suspect. And so I just last night stuffed in the intro video for that if you haven't seen it. So I'm going to show that now. It does have a couple swear words in it. So anyone under 18 has to leave at this point. Peggy, 18. <laughs> Detectives aren't supposed to get bloody knuckles, but I've done a lot of things I wasn't supposed to do. I lived through it all. Beatdowns, the backstabbing, disrespect most people wouldn't see in 10 lifetimes. And I never lost a fight. Until now. Hey man, what are you doing? Hey! Move away from the body now! What the fuck is this? Hey, did you hear me? So that's going to be fun next week. <laughs> but let's get back to the postcards. I mean, that's the most important part here, right? So uh, flying, they imagined other ways you might fly. You know, maybe you have uh, wings that could flap or something. Um, may maybe if you had flapping wings, you could uh, it would be a great way to put out fires, and uh, you could rescue babies. That's always really important. Um, you know, this idea of flying firemen, this is apparently, they look like soldiers to me, but apparently it says that they're firemen down here. Um, you know, so maybe you'd have flying firemen. Uh, we do have flying firemen today. We got smoke jumpers, so they were kind of right with that prediction. Uh, this is one of my favorites, though, of all the cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're getting the same conclusion that I, you know, sometimes there's room for interpretation on these things, but my interpretation is that this, this kid's job is to turn the crank, shred the knowledge that the professor is feeding into the shredder, and I, you know, I assume this machine shreds it down small enough that it can travel through the wires and directly into the brains of the students. Whoa. 
<laughs> Which is how school works today, right? <laughs> Actually, this, so this reminds me of a few different things. So this reminds me one of this book, Rainbow's End, which is an awesome science fiction book if you haven't read it. It has a bunch of augmented reality in it. Uh, but it also has this kind of futuristic Google-like entity that's destroying all the libraries in the world, shredding them because that's the easiest way to scan the books. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like that. Um, but it also reminds me of, of, of another company that I, I started to work with and joined the board of, um, a company called Op Emotive. And I went to Australia to meet this guy, um, a professor down there. And he is a brain researcher, and he's an interesting guy. <laughs> but what, what he does is study um, autistic savant children. So these are kids who um, are autistic, but they have some savant-like abilities. And some of them have the ability to like, look at a tree and immediately tell you how many leaves are on the tree, for example. Or some of them are artistic savants. Uh, the, this, this horse and rider here was drawn by a two-and-a-half-year-old girl. Um, so his theory, Dr. Alan Snyder, his theory is that we all have these savant-like abilities, but they're suppressed by the neocortex, the outer layer of our brain. And if we could just get that outer layer of our brain out of the way, we would you know, have these sort of magical powers. And um, so like all great professors, he experiments on his grad students. And, and he, what he does is he has them take a test, and then he puts a big electromagnet on their head and he sends an electromagnetic pulse through their head that temporarily disables a part of their neocortex. <laughs> now, I did not volunteer to try this. <laughs> but the, these helmets that he uses the, with um, the little EEG readers on them became the basis of a company called Emotive. And the idea with Emotive is not to send something into your brain, but, but just to read what's going on in your brain and to effectively try to read your mind and then use that um, as a game controller. It took 200 years to fill the Library of Congress with all of its information. Today, we create that amount of information every 15 minutes. The future is going to be fun. If it's not, why bother going? The intelligent future will have many new ways to play. Smarter technology will blur the line between what is real and what is not. New immersive games require new ways to play them. Future gamers won't need a joystick or a paddle. They'll interact with their games directly from their brains using devices like the Epic headset from Emotive. Our whole interaction with the virtual world is going to be far more natural. We'll be able to use our brain um, and our facial expressions and our emotional experiences to really experience content in an entirely new way. And what we've created is a brain-computer interface that really transforms the way that humans interact with machines. The Emotive Epic wireless headset has 16 independent sensors that pick up electrical brain signals on the surface of the scalp. We identify um, a signature for a particular thought or a particular emotion, and then in real time, we classify those brain patterns. So when you think it, it happens on the screen. You think push, the object propels forward. So now my master's showing me how to pull using that tree. Then he'll ask me to focus all my thoughts on pulling that tree towards me. There are 13 individual detections, push, pull, lift, drop, left, right, and then rotation in six different axes in a 3D environment. You can even visualize an object disappearing, and it will. But the headset is more than just a brain-powered joystick. It allows the game to detect whether or not you're actually having fun. It observes your experiences, excitement versus calmness, immersion, tension, frustration, engagement. There are these mischievous spirit wisps that instead of pressing a button, I can scare away just by looking fierce. So, And you can notice by the sky color that I enjoy that part. So when it comes to future game playing, 
Keep an open mind. We're really only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible. <laughs> so this isn't something that's uh, part of our gaming experience yet, but uh, who knows? We may, this may happen. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the, the device does work. Uh, there was an art uh, article last week, a uh, group, I think they're out of University of Utah, were using a similar headset to control drones and they had students who had trained on them and were flying them through loops in an in, in a indoor room. So, it's, you know, this kind of stuff is coming. Yeah, military is potential uh, use, yeah. Way <laughs> yeah, I agree. But back to the postcards. Uh, uh, this is nice. Uh, in the year 2000, we will walk on water. And then we will do it with, I, I assume those are hydrogen-filled balloons. So I think that's an awesome idea. And then we also, <laughs> to make it more fun, we'd, we, you, you wear little boat shoes, too. Um, <laughs> I love, and you got the horse doing it, you know. <laughs> I love these things. Um, I, I always try to find some modern example. This one was hard. I, I found this guy, but he was, you know, he was in the balloon, so that didn't seem right. Um, I, found, I found this guy. Maybe it was a little closer. Um, you know, they imagine, you know, this is kind of Jules Verne that we might all have personal submarines. We might uh, travel below the sea and have elegant dinners. Uh, do you have a personal submarine? I, I don't know. Paul, don't, Allen Paul Allen does have a personal submarine, and there it is. Uh, he was the only one I could think of either. But, um, but yeah, so I guess, I don't know, do we give them full credit for this prediction? I'm not sure if it only applies to Paul Allen. Um, <laughs> How about partial credit? Partial credit. We'll give them partial credit. But, they, you know, this is, I think, is, even, is probably even more credit for this one. You know, this is kind of a tourist submarine. And, and I've been down in a tourist submarine in Hawaii. They're, they're quite, quite common and easy to get on. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, they imagine we might play games underwater, a little underwater croquet. I found this, again, not, not really the same thing. Um, uh, maybe we, this one I, confuses me. <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure if in the year 2000 the seahorses are really big or if we're really small. I don't know, but um, that, one, that, that one's hard to give me any credit for. Um, but you know, this is a lot more practical. Uh, you know, the idea that maybe you would um, help make the weather nicer in your city by uh, putting a, a giant roof over the whole city. You know, that's a good idea. Um, or, um, you, you know, this next one, maybe even better, you could build, uh, I, I gave this talk for the first time in, in Berlin last month, and uh, so I had them read this to me, and it says, good weather machine, which is the nice thing about German, you can kind of just read it. Um, but anyway, so they imagine we might make good weather machines to make the weather better. You know, and my point is, we already made them. You know, we made these. <laughs> we made a lot of these. I mean, pretty soon it's going to be good weather all year long, you know. <laughs> what's interesting with these slides, or, you know, these postcards, is, is not always what's there, but, but to think about what's not there. You know, um, I'm going to show a series here of, of cards where there's machines, but they never imagined that a machine might operate itself. Um, you know, so you'll, you'll always see an operator um, controlling a machine. You know, so the idea of, of some kind of thinking machine, uh, even though it technically had been invented by then, it, it's a pretty, it was a pretty tough concept. Um, you know, of course, we have the Roomba. Um, so that's, you know, one thing, you know, things that really matter. And I saw this at Microsoft, too, with the Internet. We were talking with someone earlier about the, the invention of the Internet. Um, you know, the things that really matter sometimes are the things that are most difficult to predict. Um, so, you know, computers have had an incredible impact, yet you'll never see them on these slides. Um, the Internet has had an incredible impact, yet even just a few years before it happened, you know, 
Nobody thought the internet would happen. We could talk more about that later. Um, but anyway, back to the, the, the cards. Um, so you always have operators running these machines. You know, this is a, a, a barber. Um, so you've got kind of this, I'm not sure I would get my hair cut <laughs> at this place. I, I tried to find an example. The only thing I could think of was the flow bee. Do you guys know the flow bee? <laughs> The scary thing is, the more I looked at this, especially like this kid's haircut, the more it reminded me of this kid's hair. <laughs> anyway, so you know, here's another one. You know, maybe you'd have like an automated kind of tailor uh, that would take your measurements. Uh, this is interesting because it's very similar to something I saw at CES this year. Um, and that was this. This is kind of a magic mirror. It looks like a mirror, but it's actually a big display. And there's a camera looking out, and it's taking a you know video image of this girl. But then it's superimposing clothes on top of her. And the clothes are not just stuck on top of her. They're actually fitted to her body shape. And she's pointing at buttons on it to, to scroll through different clothes until she finds the one that, that um, she likes. And so this is very real technology that I think we're going to see in retail pretty soon. Um, that particular one is OMEC? Wow. I'm an advisor to OMEC. I should know that. Um, so he mentioned OMEC, which is a, a gesture control company. Um, but what I was going to mention is that this, is, this uses um, time of flight technology, uh, depth sensing time of flight technology. And uh, that's another board that I was on, a company called Canesta. And so I want to talk a little about what they do. They make this time of flight uh, depth sensing technology. So something like PrimeSense, the first generation of Connect, it's actually really primitive. What it does is it, it effectively projects a pattern onto a scene, and then it looks at it from a slightly skewed angle, and it tries to fig calculate how much that pattern is distorted by the scene. And so it's very mathematically complex. Um, in the case of these time of flight technologies, you can think of it as sending out a pulse of light it bounces off objects in the room and comes back and hits a CCD, a, a, a little sensor just like in a video camera. Except the sensor, instead of calculating colors, calculates the time that it took for the light to fly out and come back. So at each pixel on this sensor, it, you can just read out of that pixel and it'll tell you the depth to whatever, it, it, whatever it's looking at. Now this is a this this is you're basically looking at five year old technology here, um, but even then it's super fast frame rate uh, because the chip is doing all the work, um, and it's very high quality data. This is only a 320 by 200 sensor, um, and if I kind of stall a second and go on, it'll show some other nice properties of this sensor. So. Um, Anyway, very low latency, I already mentioned. That's actually the chief scientist there playing ping pong. Um, but it's also very um, insensitive to ambient light, which is another problem with, uh, with PrimeSense. So um, the first time I saw Connect, Peter Molyneux came over to show me his game with the kid, I, whatever. Um, but it was right in front of a big window, and it just, he just couldn't get it to work. But here you can see, I mean, they're turning lights on and off. It can be completely black. It has no effect on the image itself. So anyway, when I gave this talk last month, well, OK, I, I should say, um, we sold this company to Microsoft in 2010. OK, so when I gave this talk last month, I said, I don't know what they're going to do with this technology, but my guess is we're going to see it pretty soon. And I, my next slide said, you know, Xbox 720, question mark. You know, now, now I can show, you know, say this. No, now we know for a fact that it's in Connect 2 that's part of, part of the next Xbox, Xbox One. I can, I got to practice saying that without <laughs> laughing. Um, but anyway. <laughs> I'm just telling you, this is really cool technology. And it's neat that they're building it into this next version of Xbox. Um, you know, here's another, another cool thing. Uh, you've got an architect sitting in a little box, but instead of having a whole construction crew to make the building, uh, he's got a, a machine to build it. You know, this reminds me of uh, 
Well, 3D printing, because that's something I do. There's actually people have built building size 3D printers now, and they've experimented with 3D printing buildings, which is another idea that's probably a little ahead of its time. But uh, but uh, John actually helped me get this business off to, off the ground uh, five years ago, six years ago now. Uh, I started a 3D printing company with some friends called Figure Prints, and we use color 3D printing technology to turn World of Warcraft characters and Minecraft worlds into three-dimensional physical objects. And uh, Discovery Channel did a little uh, segment uh, shot in our factory up in Vancouver, so I'm going to show that now. This is the Z-Core Spectrum 510. It's a 3D printer. <laughs> Although this machine looks like an ordinary photocopier, it prints objects in three dimensions. Simply upload a digital picture into the machine, and it creates a solid object up to a cubic foot in size. Here's how it works. First, you provide the printer with a digital 3D file. The printer's processor dissects the 3D image like a CAT scan. It slices the image into super thin layers, each less than one one hundredth of an inch, close to the width of a human hair. The slices are translated into mathematical coordinates and plotted out into a design similar to how GPS uses math to build virtual maps. Once the design is loaded and processed by the printer, the replicating begins. A roller moves a thin layer of powder from a feed bin into the printer's build chamber. The powder is a mix of plastic compounds that have to be of a certain hardness and elasticity. When dry, it has the consistency of talcum powder. Once the first layer of powder is laid down, the print heads go into action. They print color ink onto the first layer according to the object's coordinates. But this machine doesn't just print color. To build in three dimensions, the printer needs an adhesive or binder fluid to create the foundation for the final object. As each thin layer of powder is added and the layers are glued together, the build chamber lowers, ready for more ink and adhesive. This continues one layer at a time until the entire model is complete. The object's color is created by mixing three primary colors of ink held in these reservoirs, which dispense the ink through three print heads. A fourth reservoir carries clear binder fluid. This allows the machine to create white when necessary. Here's a completed print job. It comes out as a thick block of powder, but buried inside are the solid figures. The surrounding powder holds up the objects as they're being constructed. The excess powder is reused for the next print job, so nothing is wasted. Like an archaeologist wiping away the dust on an artifact, the newly printed subject is revealed. The figure is further cleaned by hand and then submerged in sealant and dried. One of these printers can create about 16 of these models every five hours.
architects and engineers use this machine for everything from scale models to machine prototypes with moving parts. You can imagine it. This machine can make it. <laughs> okay, so back back a hundred years ago, again, uh, you know, they imagined that uh, maybe we would make food a different way than we do. Uh, or than we did back then. Maybe our food would be just made from a chemistry set instead of, you know, making it out in the fields. So that's, you know, that's a pretty wacky idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this one they were really close on. They thought, um, you know, uh, x-ray technology was pretty new. Maybe the police could use x-rays to spy through walls uh, uh, on criminals. You know, and I think they, I give them pretty much full credit for that because today we use the x-rays to spy through the clothes of innocent people at airports. <laughs> uh, I have several that are, are this kind of idea and I think it's interesting um, at a time when telephones were pretty rare that they were thinking about video phones. Uh, and so, you know, here you've got somebody talking to somebody who's clearly far away in some Asian country. Um, and one thing that that's interesting to me is they never you never see screens you always see projectors so the the idea that you know you'd have some self-contained screen is again an idea that was really hard to think of but maybe maybe they had seen like a movie projector or something like that so they always have a pro projector i also love how steampunk these things are <laughs> you know because they're so high tech and yet you know and they always have the big earphone um, oh, just just one thing about the screen i mean screens are something that can really date you you know even uh, the movie blade runner uh, uh, you know saw it not too long ago and I was disappointed because everything's CRTs in that thing. So you're in the future, but they don't have flat screens. They have these curved CRTs. You know that plant bed is just sitting outside here, right? Oh, is that? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. I heard that. I got to go check that out. Um, again, here's another video telephone kind of thing. You know, you got the big horns for the speaker and the microphone. Uh, there's another one. I'm not sure why the device is in the image of the device. That that one I can't figure out, but well, they on their side. On the other side. <laughs> the camera are separate devices. Yeah, that could be. It could be. Um, I don't see it, but um, anyway, obviously we have Skype, and so that was you know that that one they did very well on. Um, I, what I've tried to find though is a video game console. You know. I've, got, I've been through many, many of these cards, and where is the video game console? And this is the closest I can come. So let me try to justify that this is a video game console <laughs> from 100 years ago. So my interpretation of this is that at a, a play, you know, uh, um, maybe a musical or something, um, they're recording it with this device here. And then you have this line. So on the other side of the line, this is being played back. Now, I take this little player piano thing here as the playback device. This is kind of like the VCR, uh, you know, with maybe holes in the tape there to play it back. And it's playing back both video and audio. And this is, well, maybe not just a, yeah, like a video Tele well, not a not a phone, but a video a video camera maybe. Um, but th and then this I think is like why do they have this inset here? It's like uh, I, I take this as well. Somebody who's not even in the room could also listen to it. So that's kind of like multiplayer gaming, right? <laughs> I, okay, I'm I'm stretching it here. <laughs> I'm pushing it. I'm I'm just trying to get to Ouya somehow. I, <laughs> I don't really know how to get there, but anyway, um, just, I don't know, I think it's actually interesting to think about what's happening to our devices. Uh, I mean, this is my phone. My phone is a black rectangle with like a thin black part around the screen that's not the screen itself. 
Uh, this is my iPad. It's a black rectangle with a thin black part around the edge. Uh, this is my TV. <laughs> it's a black rectangle, thin black part around the edge. I, I don't know what this means. It's like, you know, maybe these devices have progressed so far that design is no longer important, or you know, maybe maybe this is the last step before they disappear entirely. Uh, I don't know, but like when I was a kid, you know, TVs they had wood grain, right? <laughs> wood grain finish. They had design. They were. Furniture. They were they were furniture. This is the this is the TV I grew up with as a kid. My dad uh, paid for college by repairing TVs, and so he was into TVs. This was one of the first color TVs that was available, and I didn't know that as a kid. I just knew we had this big TV. This thing is the size of a washing machine. It has about a nine-inch diagonal screen, and the tube is so big it actually sticks out the back of this box. This box, you know, but this is, the mach this is the device that, you know, I watched, you know, Gilligan's Island and The Love Boat and all that great stuff growing up, you know. Really spent my time well. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, no, this is where I watched, um, I watched Man Land on the Moon for the first time on this device. And uh, that's something they predicted that we would do. Although I think this one, yeah, they thought it would take till the year 2012 before we'd land on the moon. So um, sometimes... It's not like we can do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. This is, we have to take the point away from them? Is that the... <laughs> Very good point. Uh, but, you know, this idea of, of kind of this wood grain, retro, you know, this is, this is an actual device. You can buy this. They make these. This is a steampunk laptop. And when you turn that, that key, it actually boots the machine. So, but, um, you know, it's, uh, there was one game console that had wood grain. You're right. It was the Atari 2600. And as Brian was hinting earlier, um, I did as sort of a nostalgic fun thing, you know, because the Atari 800 was based on the 6502, and there's a great book called Racing the Beam. I did go back uh, in, in the year 2010, and I wrote a game for this device. And uh, I wasn't sure what to make, so I made Halo. So uh, Halo 2600. Now, this, this machine came out in 1977. Uh, it has 128 bytes of RAM. Okay, uh, I have a whole hour-long talk about why it's really hard to program this machine, but I won't get into it now. But I'm just going to show you Halo 2600. Uh, just, I just want you, before you see it, to realize it's a really hard machine to get anything to show up on the screen. And you have two monochrome sprites, uh, and they're 8 bits wide. But anyway, here is my interpretation of Halo if it were released, you know, in 1977. So. <laughs> So there's the Master Chief. He runs around. He has to get his gun. And he's going to go off. And oh, there's a grunt. Quick, kill it. That explosion is actually code. That saves me some memory. I only have uh, 4K for the entire program. There's 64 rooms to battle your way through. Uh, he has to pick up keys. So I, I did change the game play a little to be a little more retro. The key lets him through to the next section. Anyway, he fights his way through 64 rooms and then there's a big boss encounter at the end. So, so that was a lot of fun to make. And I'm almost done with this talk. Um, but before we retire to the smoking room, uh, and, uh, heated with a radium power source, as in <laughs> this nice uh, card, I think uh, it's important for us to reflect on uh, a, a quote from one of the great inventors of, of the 20th century, a guy named Alan Kay. And what Alan Kay said is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And all of us here, you know, the, the programmers, the artists, producers, designers, you know, I think what we all have in common is that we're makers. You know, we build shit. <laughs> you know, we create worlds. You know, we don't have to sit around and dream about what the future might be like. Uh, you know, the secret from the future is, is we can make it be the way we want it to be. You know, we can create a, a, a world where magic is possible. A world where little kids don't have to be bored. <laughs> 
uh, you know, a better world for my kids. A better world for everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Are we going to do questions or not? Just you, oh, yeah. You want I could. But I don't. I, it was such a beautiful finish. <laughs> um, and we are on time. So, uh, yeah. It's up to you. You guys want questions? Yeah. Who wants to ask the master of the future? <laughs> this young man does, please. Hey. This is more of a comment that Halo game up there is actually really exists in that version because I have played it. I knew that. <laughs> but you're right. Uh, it, it has been made. It's a real thing. It really runs on Atari 2600s. Uh, I wrote it. It um, is. There are about a thousand cartridges out now for it. Uh, it runs on real cartridges. You can plug into the machine. Uh, the easiest way to play it is to go to Halo2600.com, and there's a flash emulated version of it. Uh, but it's it's running the actual code of the actual cartridge. It's just doing it in a flash emulator and a web page, so you can have the pretty real experience. Um, yeah. So just think, you know, you say that there are two black boxes with black sides. So the next step would be the wall, but that's how it is in Fahrenheit 451, and they don't really like it quite so much. So I'm just wondering, like, do you think that we should move all the way to every wall being uh, an ultimate display, or should we just leave it with the black mirror? I'm not a designer. <laughs> I mean, I really don't know. I don't know. I'm just pointing out something I think is strange. I don't know what it means. Will we go through this period of no, of jobsy and no design, uh, you know, minimalist design, and come out the other side and and then embrace cool sort of Victorian flair again, or you know, or will or will these things just disappear like you say, just into the walls, into the surfaces, you know? Um, have you seen like these uh, body-mounted projectors where a guy will look at his wrist and something projects onto his wrist a watch, that kind of thing? So there's no act the, the device isn't even actually where he's looking. So um, Jerry um, Jerry Ellsworth is working on these augmented reality uh, glasses that she just showed at Maker Faire a few weeks ago, and they actually they're glasses with little projectors over the uh, eyes, and they project out and then bounce off this retroreflective surface. And it's I, I've I've tried it; it's very cool. So who knows? I don't know. I don't know. That's the bottom line, I guess, of this talk is I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah. What technologies are coming out inside your phone? That's a good question. You'd think I'd have an answer to that. <laughs> uh, it just for me personally, I don't know. I'm into like, I, I don't know. I think I'm getting old. I like, I like stupid stuff around the house. Like I really get excited when I screw in an LED bulb and I know it's not going to burn out for 10 years and, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, so, and, and the electric car stuff I think is really cool. I'm, I'm designing a house right now that's a little unusual, and so I'm excited to build that, maybe start next year. Um, uh, <laughs> I do have a 26 foot tall Anubis, but that's a different topic. <laughs> I, I would be happy to talk about it though, if someone asked a question, the appropriate question. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so I think, I don't know, I'm just more the, kind of that stuff. Um, I'm excited about what's happening in, in the game business. I'm still at heart a gamer and a programmer. And so, um, you know, I did all the client side programming for figure prints. Um, I have some game ideas I'd like to program. Um, and so we'll see. Um, we'll see. Yeah. I used to, whenever I talk to, I, I used to like interview futurists for this website I was working for, and uh, I always would say, not futures, but people who work in tech. And I would always say, okay, we've got phones, we've got the iPad, this is before, this is like three years ago. What do you think the next form factor would be? And none of them would have an answer. So I would say, well, we have the phone and it's perfect at that size. We have the 10 inch tablet and it's perfect at that size. I don't see anything next around that realm. Since then, we've got the 7 inch tablet and that's actually a different form factor. And now we've got Google Glass. I still talk to people and I say, what do you think the next form factor is? And they still don't have an answer for me, so I've changed my question, and I'd like to ask it to you as well. Good, because I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> what will America get first, flying cars or the metric system? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think they're both, those are both the things that are going to just stay 50 years away for a, <laughs> a long, long time. I, you know, the, the iPad thing, though, is interesting. I, I, you know, Jesse Shell did that uh, amazing talk about sort of the gamification of the future several years ago at Dice, and then they, they edited it down and put it on TED, but it's better to see the full one. Um, but the, in the full version, the iPad had just come out, and he talks about why the iPad's going to fail. And, <laughs> and, and, and it's, really, it's really interesting. Basically, he, his argument is that devices that are a combination of multiple things um, only work if they fit in your pocket. That's his argument. I, you know, I, people come up with the most... Uh, People come up with all kinds of reasons why things are going to fail, and I don't think anybody really knows, to be honest. I mean, I've been involved with projects, you know, when we were going to do, when we were going to get into games, everybody said Microsoft will never be able to get into games. When we were going to do the Xbox, everybody said Microsoft will never be able to make a game console, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I just, you know, you just have to build stuff, not listen to people, and some things will work and some things won't, and that... We, I mean, we had so many. That's a whole other thing. But yeah, we had to very, we had to very slowly uh, bring Microsoft management in line with uh, doing more and more edgy things. We, we actually did a game early on that you might recall, John, called uh, Deadly Tide, and um, we we had two games that season, and we the marketing guys. Per, specifically chose provocative names because we're trying to get more rope to do more things the next season. And so one was called Hellbender. So to have Microsoft and Hell on the same box, that was a big deal. And then, um, and then Deadly Tide. And actually, the reason we were worried about Deadly Tide was the, uh, the head of marketing at Microsoft at the time, a guy named Bob Herbold, he came from Procter & Gamble where they make Tide. <laughs> So we were worried that it was going to get like shot at you know the highest level. But anyway, but we and we had a meeting with Bill and Steve Ballmer and Bob Herbold was there and basically Bill's like, oh yeah, this stuff's all fine. And then they were all like, yes, it's fine. <laughs> you know. So. There was never a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> well, a 26-foot statue of Anubis is a perfect segue to my flip of that question, which is, what technologies that are either recent or on the horizon frighten you? Uh, the, the thing I am most scared of, uh, and I don't know if this is just out of ignorance or not, is the bio stuff. Um, I mean, I think... <sighs> You know, one way to think about the future is it's empowering individuals more and more and more. And that can be a great thing, and it can also be a really, I think, scary thing. You know, and we can see that in Boston when, you know, one guy can make a bomb out of simple materials that, with instructions he got off the internet and kill a bunch of people. Um, you know, people are building uh, genetic labs in their basement now. You can buy gene sequencers. You can put stuff together. I mean, there's going to be like a hacker revolution, but with biology. And um, honestly, that's the one thing that scares, scares the daylights out of me. I mean, I think it's interesting, but I think the idea that somebody could make something that could really harm a lot of people is a very scary thing. Um, I don't think GMO wheat is that scary. I mean, there's, I think there's, uh, I, but I, I worry more about someone intentionally doing it, um, and um, and the technology is becoming cheaper and easier to get, and the knowledge is becoming easier. So, um, anyway, that that's the part that scares me. All right. Thanks, thanks, uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> What's the thing that makes you the happiest about the future? Because we can't have this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my kids love video games. My kids, if you ask them, they both say they're going to work in the video game business when they grow up. I'm trying to discourage them. <laughs> oh, my, you know, my dad was really into airplanes his whole career, and he was um, an engineer and uh, really just loved airplanes. And um, you know, and he got to work at Boeing, worked at Boeing his whole career on airplanes in a really exciting time for airplanes and airplane development. And I think we are alive today in a really exciting time for video games. And you know, somebody like me, I've seen it from when it just started to, to where we are now. Um, and, uh, and so I don't know. Honestly, with my kids, I don't, I, 
I'm really honest when I say I don't know if I want them to get in this business, not because I don't believe in it or don't love it, but because I don't know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather have them be in, excited about the next thing and be in at the beginning of the next thing, you know? But, um, but, but who knows? I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong, I'd, I'd, I'd love it if they got in the game business, I'd be very proud, but, but I wonder if they'd have an even better time if they were in at the ground floor of whatever is next and going to be really, really cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah.